Good morning, everybody. How are you? Does everybody know Mandy Abbott? Mandy, walk up here so we can see you. Mandy was kind enough to bring in breakfast for everybody I today. Thank you so yeah, much. it's so nice. Right. <laughs> Mandy, uh, Mandy, there's also people at our oh. school watching. Hi. Mandy Abbott, can you tell us what Hi. do you do, Mandy? I am a transaction coordinator. So my company is FTC. You may have heard of me from Carlos and Richard, uh, but I support a lot of the agents in this office. So. If you have any questions about transactions or disclosures or paperwork or whatever, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I left my business cards in the back. For those of you on Zoom, I, I can throw it in the chat if you want. Um, but yeah, I'm I try to be pretty responsive. So uh, <laughs> text me. I would say that's me. an understanding. Man. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I personally recommend you. I <laughs> thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thank you very much. Of course. Our guest speaker is the leading presenter of seminars on property condition disclosure strategies. He has a unique ability to take what works in court and apply it to the real world experiences of real estate professionals. Mr. Brand was a licensed general contractor and has personally inspected thousands of residential properties. He now works as a litigation consultant, a contributing author to Realtor Magazine and a speaker on effective disclosure techniques. Today we'll talk about disclosure issues on the RPA. Limiting lawsuits, a uh, quick review of the TDS and AVID possibly, and new strategies for limiting litigation. So before we begin, Mr. Brand has a few guests that he'd like to introduce. Robert? Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I've been here several times before, but with the COVID thing, not in, I think, the last two or three years. Have any of you ever heard me? Yes. A couple of you have. Okay, because I don't like to do the same thing over and over again. I actually... This is my 32nd year, believe it or not, talking about this in California. And I have around 30 hours of different material PowerPoint based, so I can just go on forever. But so uh, I'm just gonna go for like five hours today. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'll go for like 35 minutes. So anyway, and if you have any questions as I go through this, please raise your hand. I don't think, uh, I can stay after if there are any questions, but if there's something I say that you have a, like a quick question, just raise your hand, I'll try to try to answer it. Um, I do not charge for what I do, and I do not sell anything for what I do. So I am very uh, graciously sponsored by service providers who like to say a few words to everybody. And uh, here's the list, but I'll we'll do them one at a time. And is, uh, Rosie is um, on, her way. on her way. Okay, I'll have her come back in. But um, also for the Rosie is First American Home Warranty. Candy's with First American NHD. And you want to say a few words? So take it away. Good morning, everybody. Am I in the right spot? Yep. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see so many faces again. Um, not on a little screen on the computer, but I uh, just wanted to remind you First American NHD is actually, well, our company has been around, it's a Fortune 500 company. We've been around for 133 years. We have been doing NHD reports longer than anybody else has. And uh, we seriously, over 40 years, coming up on 5 million reports, and we've never one time had to use our E&O insurance. It's a phenomenal report, and there's so many advantages to it. We have, um, we actually do our taxes in-house. We don't use a third-party provider for that. We have uh, live case hero information as soon as it's recorded. We have that information within hours. We um, also with AB 38, as we identify not only the high, but the very high fire severity zones. The other thing that we do on our report is we actually include the local contact information depending on what city you're on. And most of Orange County is uh, for a defensible space inspection. And most of Orange County is actually in, um, falls under the Orange County Fire Authority who have been phenomenal with support and doing these, these inspections for you. But also, if it happened to be in Newport or Fullerton or Laguna Beach with their own fire departments, we actually have their contact information in there as well. Um, other than that, um, if you haven't given me a try, I would I would truly appreciate it. I uh, just a little bit about me. I've actually been doing NHD for First American. I couldn't imagine working for another company, and I'm coming up on 17 years, so there's not too much that I don't know about. I'm always available if you need me on nights and weekends. I encourage you to give me a call because I cannot stand when I try to call somebody for something and they say you have to wait till Monday. I will not make you wait till Monday. 
So anytime nights, weekends, give me a call. And thanks for the opportunity. And Mandy, thanks for the great referral. You did a beautiful job on the breakfast. And I love, love, love that I have a new place to go to now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job. Good job. Okay, Justin's here with Amerispect, local guy just a few miles away. So, Thanks, Bob. Yeah, good morning. My name is uh, Justin Woodford. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm with Amerispect Home Inspections. Along with my parents, we have owned Amerispect since 1988. So in those 34 years, we've actually performed over 150,000 home inspections in Orange County. So we bring a lot of experience to the table. Some things that kind of differentiate us from our competition is number one is our training. In California, there's no licensing for home inspectors. So basically, anyone in this room tomorrow can grab a ladder and a flashlight and away you go inspect the house. Uh, my guys have to go between a four to six month training with a master inspector. That's three jobs a day, five days a week. Not only are they learning what to look for, which is obviously important, but they're also learning how to talk, which is equally as important, if not more important, in my opinion. There's a lot of different ways to say the same thing. And our guys truly understand their role in the transaction process. We're not there to be deal killers. We're not there to be the scary guy. We know that the buyers are excited to buy the house. We want them to stay excited. So we, we know it on the positive and the negative. We're trying to bring the light to the house instead of just, just being beat it down. Uh, number two is um, uh, our service. I know you guys don't sit up at night and think, what can we do for my home inspector? Or what can my home inspector do for me today? But uh, honestly, we try to go above and beyond. We have over 10,000 10 out of 10 reviews. And if you were to do a word scrub on those, 10,000 uh, reviews, service is the number three word that comes up. Number one is professionalism. Number two is thoroughness. And then the third thing that differentiates us is um, I stand behind my guy's work. Well, what does that mean? It means if my guy goes out, could have seen, should have seen, and didn't see something that's within our standards, I'll either fix it or replace it, no questions asked. And I'm able to do that because I am a larger home inspection company where the small independent companies really don't have the resources to stand behind their work that way. Um, we don't screw up a lot, but when we do, we make sure to make it right. Um, some new services that we're, that we're providing, I put some stuff on the desk. Uh, pool Star is, is a pretty cool one. So now when we do a pool inspection, um, the client gets a free app that has a live chat feature so they can push a button on their phone and a guy comes on FaceTime and says, all right, turn that valve to turn on the spa or push that button to turn on the lights or whatever. But he's live right there telling them. So, and that's free. It's included in every pool inspection that we offer. Um, so that's kind of a pool service. Um, another one is sewer scopes. I don't know if you guys have been really too familiar. One quick story before um, I run with the sewer scope. My best friend was buying a house in San Juan and it was built in 2014. And he's like, you know, I'm like, do you want a sewer scope? He's like, what do you think? I'm like, ah, you know, it's so new. I don't know. I probably could just not do it. Well, the day of the, ins of the inspection comes around and I'm there, my sewer scope guy was right down the street. And I'm like, hey, you're right here. Let's just let this happen. You do it. You know, it's not going to cost my buddy any money. Luckily, we found a $50,000 problem where the main line was disconnected at the street. And I mean, we could have not seen that so easily. So now from now on, it's like, why would you not stick a camera down there just to see what's going on? I mean, it, it seems silly not to at this point. Um, because now the cameras are so easily getting in there and out. So we would recommend the service if you guys, uh, if you guys want to try it. Thank you guys so much for having me. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Great job. Great job. Uh, I see that Rosie has appeared. And let me go. There you are. First American home warranty. That doesn't look like me anymore. <laughs> Maybe if I do this. I made it smaller. Uh, and I'm a little blonder. So um, with that First American home warranty, when you have a question or a concern or a denial, it's always an email to me with a full property address in the subject line and tell me what's going on. I am not privy of the claim because I am in sales. I am running around doing my dog and pony show. I have to reach out to the office and ask them. When I do, I get the facts that are necessary to then communicate back to you with what? One, a strategy to possibly turn a denial around, or two, to confirm what was said on the denial or on what they're going to replace, or three, what is the cost that it is that we are paying out for repairs? Okay, there seems to be some confusion with homeowners, agents, and clients. 
The reason is, you guys, we are in a very litigious area. We can only speak to the policyholder. So who is your line of communication? That would be me. So please help me help you with doing this process because I do cover a wide area and I am very good at navigating through a difficult situation. Objection handling is my specialty, hence the goddess of chaos. When it comes to home warranty, it's never easy. But in the struggles, we get the most gain and we retain those customers with the win. So I am here to offer up myself. Anytime you guys want to do a three-way call, meaning a conference call with yourself and the client to one, explain the coverage. I have found that homeowners do not understand home warranty. They have no idea what it covers, why it covers. I got a call today about a pool. And they're like, my pool's leaking. Does home warranty cover a leaking pool? Well, it depends. What is leaking? Is it the equipment or is it the structure? Equipment, yes. Structure, no. So it's just like any other insurance. There's middle ground, there's gray areas. So if you need that assistance, please reach out to me. I'm Rosie Pool, First American Home Warranty. And thank you for your loyalty in this office you have uh, fed my kids last year and <laughs> god knows i need you to feed my kids this year <laughs> thank you <laughs> so thank you thank you Rusty. good and just one more and that is david with lloyd pest control and uh, one testimony i can give i live in san diego and um my wife saw a rat in our yard which became a complete freak out and um <clears throat> i didn't say rats do exist but that didn't make a difference and um so we called them we have a monthly service, and I am sponsored by every termite company you can think of in California, and we chose Lloyd, so good work on your part. Thank well, you. Congratulations. Yeah. All right, so uh, I don't know most of you here, but uh, I'm David with Lloyd Pest Control. Most of my uh, customers know me David the termite inspector. Um, one thing that we do with our company is when I do an inspection, before I leave the property, you're getting a report right there from LT. It's going to have pictures of what I found, if there's anything, um, and it's instant. As long as I have the right email address, sometimes it kicks back and uh, it's our system. But um, we've been in business since 1931. This uh, new system that we did is about four years old and it's phenomenal. Um, the newest thing that we've added to it is when you have a house that's fumigated, if I find anything to be fumigated, uh, if you have a tile roof, we have an outside uh, roofing contract that we deal with where any tiles that are broken is replaced. And it's, there's no extra cost for that for you. Um, typically, with a roof that's uh, you know concrete or clay, you're getting those 15 to 50 broken tiles minimum. Um, that's that can be a nightmare. Luckily, we take care of that for you. Um, I'd love to have your business. Thank you. Well, Thank I have you. a question about the roof. Yes. So, uh, how do you know that the tiles are broken before? So after? yeah. So uh, let's say we we set up our fumigation date. My uh, roofing contract will be there the day before with the joint flyover. You can identify. Which tiles are already previously broken, which ones are not, and uh, afterwards another drone drone flyover happens again, and it's going to have the individualized reporting. Both of those can be emailed to you. So every time you fumigate, that's what you're saying. Exactly. Thank you for the point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so my seminars disclose everything. Goodbye. But I'm I'm, I'm going to stretch it out a little bit. <laughs> Um, one more sponsor can't be here, but I'll do it and I'll do it really quick. Legal Services of America. They do not conflict at all with company attorneys or anything like that. What they do, just mainly the top point I'll cover. After closing, if buyers and sellers get into a tussle over the condition of the property, buyers are upset about this wasn't disclosed. And that's where a lot of the lawsuits kind of foment. They come in and they have mediators and about 95% of the time they resolve it. So it does not end in a lawsuit. That, the, that now the real estate firm is going to have to be in. And it's just a phenomenal thing. It's extremely popular all over California. So I'll uh, get their numbers to you. So all right, let's get going. Um, I will provide um, uh, seminar notes after this. I'll email them to your office. And they've been updated several times since the last time I was here. A lot of you know who Gov Hutchison is. If you haven't seen him, I'd like to do a big shout out to him. He's the kind of the Pope of everything regarding real estate. 
and I have the privilege of sharing the stage with them when there's not a pandemic up in Northern California, but you haven't seen them or heard them, always worth the while. Um, and uh, this topic of disclosure is the number one cause of litigation or source of litigation in the residential real estate industry in California. Nowhere else but here, but here in California, about nine out of 10 lawsuits that occur for any reason whatsoever in a transaction or after it has have to do with at least alleged failure of the sellers or the agents to disclose something to the buyer about the physical condition of the home. So it is by far the most uh, litigious. By the way, do I have to be in front of this camera here? Oh, yeah. I don't have to be, okay, all right. Um, so let's just kind of rapid fire go through some on the visual inspection, um, assuming you all use the ABID form. Um, our marching orders on how to fill it out come from the TDS or, or tedious form, if you want to call it that. <laughs> and it says that we do a visual inspection. <clears throat> well, what's happened? Does it, is it limited to just visual? The answer is actually no, even though that's what it says. It means more than that because just over years in litigation, it's expand, the, the uh, nature of, of what you do and you're still limited inspection, but it's not limited to, to just visual anymore. And they haven't changed the wording, but in court it's changed. It really has come to mean a sensor, any sensory perception. In other words, you don't have to be able to see something that you're concerned about in order to disclose it if you notice it in any way whatsoever. So two examples, let's say I've got the buyers, I'm doing my Avid thing. I'm upstairs, bedrooms, bathrooms, up, up, crossing the hallway a couple of times. And I, I get the feeling, and not the clear impression, but the feeling that it's just a little bit off kilter, a little bit uneven, not very much. And most of the time, I don't even notice that at all. But I have a couple of times I'm done upstairs, I'm starting to walk downstairs. And I think, well, I kind of look at the floor and I think, well, it looks flat to me, but I have noticed something. So that would that would prompt or should prompt a disclosure, kind of a lightweight one, like upstairs hallway floor appears to have some unevenness. Now, when the buyers move in, if they don't notice anything at all, then it's like no harm, no foul. They, the, the disclosure makes no difference. They don't do anything about it. Um, but if they do notice something, they're maybe just sort of sensitive on that, on balance or whatever, you have made a disclosure and that can uh, keep you out of a lawsuit, protect your company, protect you and so forth. But you haven't seen it. You have just noticed it in another sensory perception. Now I'm downstairs, maybe the family room area, and there's a really, really heavy, like musty smell. It's just like overwhelming. And I'm thinking that even when the uh, sellers move out, this is such a strong, heavy smell that it's going to linger on even when they clean the place up. And it's going to probably bother, bother the buyers. It bother me if I was a buyer. So a lot of agents would say, or would write down, there's like a strong musty odor in this area. Well, the two problems are the word strong. It's an adjective. Let me just get the adjectives out of the way. We never wanna use adjectives in disclosure. Advertising all day long with almost no litigation. So like in advertising, you can have beautiful, wonderful, majestic, expansive, uh, phenomenal, and just there's almost no lawsuits, even if the view isn't phenomenal, that just they won't sue over that. But in disclosure, no adjectives at all. Big, small, major, minor, fair, poor, long, short, colors, numbers, just leave them out. So like strong mildew odor, you'd wanna drop the word strong. That could be debated with you on the stand, for five or six hours and never get off the word strong, ever. It's just brutal, but they can't do it to you if you don't write the word down. And then mildew is very much like musty and mildew and musty are way too close to mold. We never want to get anywhere near that word. So we don't want to use that word itself. It is a professional diagnosis by like an environmental engineer, somebody of that nature that's got the license and credentials and all of that. So you still wanna point something out because you're thinking this really smells bad here and a, a cleanup job in the house is not gonna get rid of it. Um, so you gotta write something down. You're not gonna write down this part of the house really stinks. You're not gonna do that. Gotta come with something better. So in the notes somewhere, I've got like obvious odor noted, um, uh, some like generic term, noticeable odor in this area, but you just wanna avoid mold, certainly mildew, musty, because 
musty and mildew are too close to mold, but you're still making a disclosure. So the wording makes a difference. Um, and I'll have other examples in the notes. So it's really any sensory perception at all. It's not only visual. Um, and when you're going room to room, filling out the AVID, the con unless you can't find anything at all, which I'll get to, because sometimes the home's in pristine condition and there's just nothing to say, and you don't want to make something up. But when there is something to say, the commentary room to room, each comment must be either a defect or a red flag, N no others than that. And you know that I think, but I'll give you an example that can, it, an example of something that can trip you up. So by way of definition, if you have any questions again, raise your hand because I go on here. A defect is, is like a broken window. And if you see a broken window, like in the kitchen, that's the whole disclosure, cracked window, broken window. It's not a big crack because big is an adjective. You can have people come into court and argue. It's not big, it's medium, it's small, it's this or that. It, they can't argue with you if you don't write the word down. So cracked window at uh, you know kitchen window or something like that. Again, not a big crack, small crack, upper right corner crack, this just cracked window, period. No one can argue with that statement. They can argue if you, just, if you modify it a little bit. Then the defect, like a stain, let's say this stain was like maybe a little bit bigger, ceiling stain. The most, I look at, hundreds and hundreds of avids every year. And the most common disclosure for something like this is like maybe large water stain. Well, you of course have to drop large, no matter how big it is um, or small. And stains can occur from a lot of things other than water. Uh, it could be, um, they have like white wine stored up in the attic and a bottle broke or a rodent problem. I don't know what it's from. I actually don't care what it's from. Now I might, well, I might care as a representative of the seller or the buyer, but I don't care in terms of the form. The form doesn't require, and we don't want to have any specifics other than alerting a buyer, something that's really obvious, but maybe they're obsessed with the house and what bedrooms are the kids gonna be in and they just don't notice it, but you do, and it's your responsibility. So stain noted, discoloration noted, Forget water, forget big, forget small. You, I mean, if it's right above a, a window, you know, backyard window, you could say above the backyard window in the ceiling, something like that. So we just have to be careful that we keep it, keep it brief. Uh, two quick challenges, and then I'll get on to some other things. There's a lot of challenges. I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, let's say I'm in the living room and I can't find anything wrong. This happens a lot in homes that are just kept up well. So I've looked around adequately. I don't want to take a half hour, but I've looked around adequately and there's just nothing to say. Well, I don't want to say everything is just great because that's a compliment. We don't compliment anything on the Avid. Um, but I noticed a ceiling fan. I think, oh, good. I got something to say. <laughs> ceiling fan noted. The problem is a ceiling fan is not a defect or a red flag. It's inventory. So now I've introduced a new category that doesn't belong on the Avid. That's inventory. And since I've started with that in the living room, I need to be consistent and mention the inventory in the entire house. And now the avid gets all filled up with all kinds of minutia about a topic that doesn't belong there. And that's not gonna work. There is a solution I'll mention in a moment. The other of many challenges I'll mention is, just, I call it the spider web challenge, literally or figuratively, what happened here, I can see. Yeah, yeah. Literally or figuratively. Um, uh, hold on, technical problem, spider web. See, now I got to start all over again. My name is Robert Graham. Thank you. No, uh, so um, I, I, again, I look at a lot of avids and I have, I see a lot of them, quite a few of them that they'll have like a spider web, a spider web in the corner or same level, a scuff mark at the baseboard by the door or the carpet's dirty. These are, like normal wear and tear things that do not rise to the level of disclosure. If the home's at least a year or more old, it's prop, if they have kids especially, it's probably gonna be found everywhere. These are issues that do not affect the value or desirability of the property. A scuff mark or a little patch of dirty carpet does not affect value or desirability, so it doesn't qualify as a disclosure. So uh, that creates a problem, or a, not a problem, but a challenge. What do you do when you're done with your AVID 
and this tends to be more with higher end homes than lower, but it can be anywhere. You've really done a good job with your Avid, but you have nothing to say. You cannot find anything wrong with the home. Well, companies have different policies on this. The one that is overwhelmingly most popular in California, but I kind of equally cover the whole state, but make sure if I say anything that that's not company policy here, you go with company policy here. But the most popular expression is nothing noted. That means there is a living room. I was there, I looked through it. I just didn't find anything worthy of disclosure. The only complaint I ever hear about that is when the home is in truly pristine condition and I spent like, a, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour there, I can't find anything. So I've got, the agent will ask me this, I've got nothing noted, nothing noted, nothing noted. Just like I never even showed up, I got nothing to say. I was there for like 45 minutes and I've absolutely nothing to say. And there is a solution to that, which I'll get to right now. And here, I usually introduce sponsors here, but on Zoom, but they've already come and gone. Okay, what do you do about the uh, chronic or repetitive nothing noted? which is really the right thing to say because you really have looked around and you just don't say anything that's worth mentioning and you don't want to get too picky because if you get picky you got to be picky in every room and you don't want to do that well here in southern california and i think everywhere in california uh not all homes but maybe like around big bear arrowhead maybe it's, there's a distinction there but overwhelmingly most homes have what we would call stucco siding you want to kind of root leave the word stucco out, but just let's say uh, exterior siding. And um, cement or concrete, driveways, walkways, uh, patios, whatever. And I think we would all agree since we all live here that it is impossible if you look all the way around the property for all of these surfaces to be crack free. Now the cracks usually don't mean anything. A lot of people call them normal settling cracks. That's really bad. That's two days in court with the agent never off the stand for the word normal and the word settling. They got geotechnical engineers, a hired gun type that come in and how in the world are you allowed to say it's from settling? That's a settling, a, um, a structural engineers uh, term or soils engineers and all that. So we don't have to use that word, those kinds of words. I'll give you another phrase that you can use. But uh, the one I like is some cracks noted at, and you can kind of fill in the blank for the property, exterior siding patio maybe driveway and rear patio is where you see it. And you maybe see it everywhere. You can make it more generic or pool side or ex left exterior side of house or you know, just fit it for the property. But I love the term some cracks because if you said two cracks at the east side of the house wall, somebody's gonna find three or four, but some is the same as three or four or five or six or one or two. So it's a really good term to use, and you may want to adopt that if you don't, if it's okay here. Um, okay, let's see. Oh yeah, if you don't know where to write some of these things on the Avid, there's other places to document it, but there is this, um, my little thing works here, yeah. Uh, this, at near the end of it, doesn't get filled out much, and a lot of agents don't even know it's there. Other observed or known conditions not specified above, if you're just not sure, where am I going to write this down? That's a good place to go, uh, if not others. Some cracks noted exterior side. And again, all this will be on the notes. Um, <clears throat> I get asked a lot about, you know, when you're working with a buyer and you're showing them a property and it is right next door to a Walmart, or there's a golf course right there out the living room window or whatever, train tracks, airport. There's something that is glaringly obvious. Some agents don't disclose it at all because they think it's an insult to their client to have to mention it because, I mean, they've been there two or three times and you can't miss it. But it's still a very good idea to disclose these things. So this is just a funny one. This is real. I took this picture. Open box before eating pizza. I had to completely change the way I eat pizza. I had no idea this was necessary. They actually have to, obviously that is there. And I've seen that on many pizza boxes because there is litigation over people that try to eat a pizza without taking it out of the box. That's why they have these. A, uh, one I saw in a, it was like a 7-Eleven and they had uh, ice for sale and it said frozen ice, which are the best kind, you know, I always look at for ice to be frozen. I don't know why they need that word there, but anyway, they do. Somebody's probably sued them. So, you know, home on the right here, school, let's say it's a uh, junior high or what, what do they have now, junior, uh, elementary, whatever, I'm changing names <laughs> anyway. 
the person that buys this house on the right, even though it's really obvious, it's by the obvious, obviousness of it doesn't make any difference. You know, you can say, well, they can see it. I don't have to say anything. You just have to say something and disclose something. Let's see, just part of the list. I'll have gridlock in the morning and afternoon with kids being dropped off and picked up, people blocking their driveway maybe or parking in their driveway, slow traffic, hard to get out, bells ringing for class changes, band practice, dances, sporting events. Now, a lot of people in the business say, well, I know my buyers want to be really close to a house. They kind of like the activity and they're, they have small kids they can go right there. And it's so obvious, I don't really need to disclose it. It's sort of like the insult to their intelligence again, but it, it isn't. It, it just isn't. You still have to make a disclosure. Um, and the problem is, or the reality is, is that you, the best way to do it, to cut to the chase, is, I usually have a long story here, but I'll skip the story. The best way to go, in my opinion, is to disclose what is there. Do not make a list of what may bother them about what's there. Because if you make a list, you will never finish the list. It will go on forever. I did a seminar on Zoom for a couple of weeks ago for what's it called Rim, Rim of the World uh, Board. I think they still use Board of Realtors. Lake Arrowhead, I think, or big, I think it's Lake Arrowhead. An agent during the Q&A thing said, um, I have a buyer that's coming here from Chicago. They lived there all their life. They're retired. This is their final move. They own a property up in the woods. And they've got uh, a little dog, I think, and there's trails around there. They, they can't wait to take the dog on trails and stuff, but they've never seen coyotes, a coyote, and we have a lot of them here. It's a problem. So I want to disclose to them for the protection of the dog and maybe them too, um, what a coyote looks like, a picture and all that. And I said, okay, you're gonna, that sounds good. We've mentioned one critter, one animal. Are you gonna mention black widow spiders, scorpions? rattlesnakes, poison oak, poison ivy, birds of prey, owls at night and hawks in the day, they can do mess up your pet too. How long is the list going to be? Well, the, the answer is you, the list will never stop. There's going to be something that's not on it. So not a, good idea to, not a good idea to make a list. So I'll give you some examples of things. You could, well, actually here, there is a school near the property. And you think, well, what if it's two blocks away? Is it near? The word near or close is up to you. There is no, having done this for a long time, I can tell you, there is no law, no statute of any kind that defines what near is. Near is a subjective term. Kind of if I was buying the home and I'd never lived here before, I would want to know about it. So it could be a, like a private airport that's maybe a mile away but the planes are taking off and landing. So that's a mile away. You normally wouldn't disclose the school a mile away, but you would an airport. So near close is up to you. So there's a school near the home, period. That means anything and everything that will happen to you or might happen to you because you live close to a school will probably be part of your life. If you make a list, the list will never be complete and their attorney will find many things that are not on the list and they'll go after you for them. And we don't want that to happen. Um, I think this is in West LA. I forgot when I took this picture, but anyway, it's a uh, you know, busy freeway. It's really hard for a house to get closer to a freeway. There's, a on, there's an on-ramp right there, right there. Now, you know, some people, uh, I mean, you can't miss it. And the can't miss it part may, makes no difference. You just you figure that they don't see it. They may like that because they, they're close to the freeway. Uh, it's, it's not a, a noise nuisance. It's like a background noise. They don't care. They lived before next to a freeway before. But like, what are you going to disclose? It's noisy. Um, it, the things vibrate because it's so close to the freeway. Trucks go by and things on the fireplace mantle are shaking. Um, and then you've got the uh, uh, fumes, the, I would say gasoline fumes. Write that down. And you find out gasoline fumes don't bother them. It's diesel fumes. You don't write that down. So you gotta write that down. Well, again, you can't make the list long enough. So there's a freeway near the house, period. Everything that may happen to you, whether you like it or not, if you buy this home, is gonna be part of your life because you can never figure out what they don't mind or what they do mind. So it, it is important, even when something is incredibly obvious to disclose it. So let's get into some examples of how, how you might want to word that. Um, 
in this closing. And again, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, disclose what is there, <clears throat> not the details of what may bother the buyers about what's there. The main thing is things may bother them that wouldn't bother you. And also a list of things that might bother them never comes to an end. It will never, ever end. So you don't want to start it. So for example, there's a freeway near the house, meaning anything and everything that happens to you when you're that close to a freeway will be part of your life. Uh, that's the way it is. There is a school close to this property. It's a much simpler disclosure and much safer than writing out a list because their clever attorney will find two or three or four things not on the list and they'll go after you for those. So uh, do not make a list of specifics in my opinion. Okay, a uh, quick little, oh yes, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. So you have a listing where if you step out the front door and mm -hmm. across the street, mm -hmm. the backyard wall sits up high and they converted the wall into a mural for Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan. Right. It's the size of this wall, but high. Right. Would you, would you disclose that? If it was for Magic Johnson and, no, <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Larry Bird. Yeah. yeah. Larry yeah. Okay. <laughs> By the way, I'm the exact same height as Michael uh, Jordan. I, he just plays a little better than I do. I can jump about that that high off the ground. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, something that might be attractive to some and might be um, uh, kind of an eyesore to others. Usually there is no disclosure because then you have to become the determiner of if it was a forest scene or an ocean who really cares if it was, you know, a, some political slogan, some, you know, it may not hurt to, st to state there is, I don't know if graffiti is the right word, but there are some of the walls in the neighborhood are painted. Walls in the neighborhood. Yeah, something like that, you know, with, with pic pictures and slogans. Yeah, <laughs> pictures and slogans. Here's a really quick way to take a rough draft disclosure. You've got something down, you're thinking, it's just a little bit too wordy. I have got to slim this thing down. It's a really easy way to do it. And it's free, you don't have to download anything, it just takes a half a minute. So uh, let's say I have the buyer's two-story home. I'm done with the upstairs. I am uh, downstairs now, I finished that. The, buy, the uh, sellers are not home, but I, and I, they're on their way home. And I wanna get out of there before they, they come back. So kind of getting through it. And I'm, the last stop is the kitchen. And this is the last thing I see, a couple of stains on the, the kitchen wall. And I'm thinking, well, what am, I, what am I gonna say about this? I'm not really sure. It could be a mold thing and could be a real, real problem, but I don't know that. And I don't want to like deliberate over it too long because I want to get out of there. So it's kind of an old fashioned trick, but it works well. Just sort of set the abbot aside and get a uh, scratch piece of paper if you're more old fashioned or get your laptop or some other place to document it, but it's not on the Abbott. The Abbott's out of sight. And for me, if I did the little scratch paper thing, to me, it looks like there's two black mold stains noted, but that's not on the Abbott. I'm now finished with the house and I can get out of there. Later on the day, I take this out and I just proceed to remove any word I can such that it still makes sense in the English language. I don't have, I never give numbers, small as an adjective, no adjectives, no colors. And there is no way I will ever write the word mold down or mold like, or even musty or mildew. Uh, all I have left over is stains noted, like stains noted to the, on the wall, to the left of the refrigerator or whatever. So that's a, uh, not perfect, but it's an ideal disclosure. I haven't set myself up for a fall with all kinds of expert witnesses, but I have let, uh, the buyer, whichever side I'm on, know that I, in course of my limited visual inspection, I saw a couple of stains on the wall. What they are is, is beyond my standard of care. My job is to alert you to something that I have seen because it's a visual inspection. Yes. So I have a question. How, how is the word small or medium or, or, or tiny, how does that backfire against the agent in court when like it? Yeah. Well, why would somebody object to it? Yeah, but how does it get the agent in trouble but for using it? Because you, like, if I said there was a small stain and they, uh, they went into litigation, they will have attorneys that will say, uh, it, it will say the stains about like this. They're going to say, in the world of mold stains, that's actually a large stain. And they will have industrial hygienists and environmental engineers come in on their side and pay them a lot of money to say, no, that's that's more medium or large. 
and I'm a industrial hygienist or certified whatever the agent is not. So they, you know, the jury takes their opinion more. And then there's just no need to actually use the words at all. So just better not to, just stain noted. Then you get, you don't say round stain, square stain, blue stain, black stain, small or just stain noted. And that's safer for you. And you're also providing a meaning, potentially meaningful disclosure for uh, the buyers, whichever side you're on. So that's, so, so that's it. Stains noted. I, I get out my, you know, I'm again, I'm away from the property later in the day. Now I get out my Avid and uh, jot that down in whatever way I do. And I'm done. Took me a few seconds. I didn't have to stand, stay around the house for 30 minutes deliberating on it. A couple of things about the new RPA. New RPA, I know you've all been probably trained <laughs> to where you can't stand anymore on this thing, especially about, about a year ago almost now. But uh, most of it is not about this topic. It's about the transaction, the escrow, the loan and all that. Not too much about my topic, but there's a few things that in the notes, I have three things in the notes, I will specify where they are on the form, the RPA, because sometimes it's hard to find things. So uh, we all know about the 1221 date and all that sort of thing. So I won't go through that. Um, so three points real, real quickly. Uh, in the RPA, it states that every home, every single home that closes escrow in California is an as-is deal. It's sold in as-is condition, meaning at the point of sale, it is what it is, whether they've done repairs, whether they haven't, it, it's, an, it's as it is. And where this can be a problem is the adding of a sign writer on a typical, what we think of as a typical as-is deal, maybe a 85 year old seller, he's moving out for good, going to, you know, Kentucky or somewhere, he is not going to fix anything. He's not going to talk about fixing anything. It's as is. That's the conventional view. The problem, the, the problem is, it, it is not the correct view. Uh, as is applies, you read it right there in the RPA, that every single property that closes escrow is considered an as is transaction. It is what it is when it closes escrow. And so that's good to keep in mind and maybe be careful about those signs. Number two, not much to say about, there's a lot to say about it. And I do in another seminar, but just for right now, because it's a big topic, just be aware. Now this applies to the real estate deal, not where you live and what you may want to do to look at the um, Department of, Ju of Justice website, the Megan's Law database, but in a transaction, it does say, Neither seller nor brokers are required to check this website, which is usually interpreted to mean don't check it. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you may want to. Uh, it, it's just different from where you live and wanting to check it and in a transaction. So in the RPA, that is what it says. You're not required to. Just good to keep in mind. And one more, and this is kind of important. When it, as the market changes and more repairs are being negotiated rather than just take it or leave it and get out of the way, there's 10 people behind you wanting to buy it. Um, when a repair has been uh, agreed to, uh, because the sellers are trying to unload the house more now than they were before, uh, they can have, unless instructed otherwise, they can have anybody do the repair. You know, the, the request is to, uh, if it's like, a, I don't know, sweep out the garage or something, I mean, a peer request, well, you don't really care who does it um, in terms of a liability. But if the request is for um, like a uh, electrical panel fix or a electrical fix where who's ever doing it is gonna have to get into the electrical panel. So there's a, certainly an element of danger. Uh, you wanna have a, light, a California licensed electrical contractor doing it. Without that statement, the sellers can have the 13 year old kid next door take care of it. And that's a big liability issue. Or another, the, uh, like the top of the roof, that doesn't get asked about too much. Something you can see from the driveway problem. Somebody's gonna have to scale that roof. We request that it be fixed or whatever, and that only a California licensed roofing contractor do the job. Um, maybe even there's a leak in the master bathroom upstairs. There's evidence of leaks downstairs now. We want a California licensed plumbing contractor. It doesn't make any difference if they want the, the, the kitchen screen door replaced. I'm not very handy. I could even do that. You take the measurements, go to Home Depot or Lowe's, get the right size and put it on. But if it's something that has a, a, some element of danger, 
it's good in the request to request uh, the, the request for repair to request the specialty person that's a licensed contractor from a liability standpoint. And that's that's it on, on my topic on the RPA. Um, okay, a few more things. Uh, can I go about ten more minutes, uh, Richard? Sure. Okay. All right. So, should you disclose? Oh, oh, these next two are are controversial, and I should have asked Richard about them before. So please interrupt me if you have a different view. I'll tell you what the majority view is, not necessarily correct, but the majority view. And this is when you're doing your AV inspection at a property that is usually a high-end property. It's just in pristine condition. And you're done with your AVID and you say, I can't find anything to say or to write down in the AVID. It's like in perfect condition. You don't, you're not gonna write down perfect or whatever. Uh, so these are usually uh, things that we look for when we can't find anything. We want something to say, you know, the scuff mark at the baseboard or the car some of the carpets dirty. These things do not affect the value or desirability of the property. If a home is going for, you know, 1.2 million and some of the carpets are slightly dirty, that does not affect the 1.2 million price tag. It just doesn't affect it. If there was a major, you know, foundation problem or something like that, then that, that would be a different category. Um, usually there's no disclosure for these observations when they're just wear and tear. And the key, do they really affect what the house is going for? That's a good way, kind of a test. But once you start disclosing them, because you're just looking for something to say rather than leaving that part of the avid blank and maybe three or four parts of the blank, uh, you don't have to leave it blank, but, but that's the concern. I got to mention something, and but once you start disclosing them, you've opened up the door to I'm going to disclose all wear and tear issues, and then you have to get into addendums and stuff if the house is big enough. So there's way too much uh, in the AVID. This is going to date me a little bit, but there's a game that if you're old enough, you might remember it's called Where's Waldo? And it's kind of hard to find them. I like him to represent a meaningful disclosure and all the other beach goers, non-meaningful disclosures. And you can't find the meaningful one because there's so much written about the wear and tear stuff. Now, if I do this, you can find Waldo very easy. I didn't know he was a real person. I saw him the other day take, being taken away by the police. But anyway, there he is. And when I remove that, it's just kind of hard to find him. I'll show you where he is. So I like all the beachgoers again to represent stuff that is filler for the avid that just clogs up the ability to see the meaningful disclosure of Waldo. So way too much in there. The other topic that has got some controversy to it is taking photos during the visual inspection made really easy, different platforms. The most popular is probably the Glide one, the zip form. And the issue is not, can you take photos as part of your visual inspection, your AVID inspection, but should you? So it's not, can I? Yeah, you can, because everybody's got a phone, everybody's got a camera on the phone, all that. I mean, going way back, some agents would bring a, like a regular old fashioned camera and have the film develop. Then you got into two disposable cameras, they were popular, but the issue is whether or not it should be done. And as I mentioned, everybody's got a phone, everybody's got a camera on their phone, but that doesn't affect whether or not we should or shouldn't do it. Well, here's um, my perspective. It's a majority perspective, but there are some, there's some changes here and there or differences. It's a visual inspection. That's all it is. And it's really good for us to keep it that way because if we add different specialties or abilities to it or attic stuff or roof stuff to it, it just gets out of hand. It's sort of a hands behind your back, somewhat focused, somewhat casual, not very long walk through the property. That's what it's meant to be. Competent and diligent visual inspection. And if you do take photos, you see like a stain, a this, a crack, take a picture of this, take a picture. If you go to court and I have helping people several times now, the accusation that is always there is you were very selective in what you took photos of. You deliberately omitted the really bad stuff. No photographic evidence of that. You just made sure you got the small stuff so it wouldn't like foul up the deal. So some agents go into video and they just do, or they take a zillion pictures or video or whatever everywhere. And um, the problem is, oh, there's an exception here, is it now is no longer a limited visual inspection. It's now using um, 
not high tech, but special equipment to get it done. And I, two things I, I'm starting to do more in person things like, like I am now today. I have had agents bring to the seminar a couple of times a drone. They say, I bought this drone. Why? Well, I, I can't see the very top of the roof when I'm doing my visual, my Abbott thing. I want to be able to see it. I said, well, if you can't see it by standing on the driveway, you're not responsible for it. Now you are. You, and then another one I've seen, I've seen several drones. <laughs> and uh, those are just the ones that people happen to bring with them. Another gizmo that you put a, against an interior wall and you look through a scope and it tell you how much moisture there is or whatever, like x-ray vision. It's like um, not a good idea. The only exception is this is a picture of a garage, let's say, and this is even debatable. I hear attorneys even debate this, but the majority that I am around say, you know, if there's one room that's just out of control, like in this case, the garage, and you want to have just evidence of it, but there's no evidence that you are, you have a trend going, you're taking pictures of everything that's a problem. You haven't taken a picture of anything, but this, maybe that's okay. But otherwise, not a good idea. We want to really want to protect the limited nature of the limited visual inspection, make sure all, all that's okay here. And then maybe I'll just do one more because this is a, um, there's a lot of, you know, things that change in, in our society and like in the homeless uh, uh, topic here. Let's say there's a really nice park in the neighborhood. It's been a big selling feature. A lot of people with families, you know, kids want to move there because the kids like to gather there and you know spend part of the day and play at the playground or whatever. And then over the years, people from the homeless community have started hanging around. So that might have changed whether the parents want their kids to go there. And now they, there's a, a number of them living there. And then that changes. And what used to be an attractive selling feature may not be. But of course, you have to be very careful about this topic because you get into like discrimination and so forth. So um, this comes up a lot when I do association of realtor things and the, their, the association's uh, attorney precedes me before introducing me. This comes up every single time. I've tried to try to consolidate, you know, what I've heard and with other people I work for. Uh, keep in mind, um, one person's nuisance is another person's joy. It's kind of like on the form. Uh, I'll get to the form in a second. On the form of the, uh, that the sellers fell out, part of the TDS. It has a, a list of a bunch of, you know, A through T or something. And all these things, are you aware of this? Are you aware of that? But it's only, are you the sellers aware of it? Like, let's say the popcorn ceiling that sometimes contains asbestos. If the sellers are 90 years old and they live there for a few years, uh, I don't want to label elderly people, but they probably aren't aware that there's probably asbestos there if the home was actually the, the year is 1972. If it's earlier than that, it will probably have asbestos, but they don't know. So they can answer it, there, there isn't any asbestos or no. And they're okay because that was their understanding. It's a very low standard, whatever their understanding is. So uh, some people consider a, the presence of an increasing homeless population as a, as a real pain in the neck and others think, well, it's great to have a place to live and so forth. So it's kind of tough to, to call it out. So when I have heard many, many times now Association of Realtor and also real estate firm attorneys talk about this. You can flip a coin. Half of them say disclose it. Half of them say don't. And so it's it's a really tough issue. So I try to reach a, a middle ground here. Um, the seller in the TDS, if they think it is a, an issue, and even by the way, a halfway house that's in a neighborhood, that gets very complicated. It's who's living in it. Is it if it's like say people that have had a problem with alcohol. Are they through the program? They are no longer technically alcoholics or don't have a problem with it. Then um, maybe there's a disclosure because they're not a protected class. They're just trying to find a job. But if somebody is, is in the process of recovery and therapy, they are a protected class. And so it can, get, it can get very, very complicated. So trying to make it simple. If the sellers consider, are you representing them? Consider, if they consider it a nuisance, it's good to point it out. They're still going to make the disclosure, not you, not you, but they may not even see this. And so right there is kind of hard to see. Neighborhood, um, noise problems, or other nuisances. Just to point it out to them, you don't have to lead them away, lead them along. Just 
you know, we talked about the homeless issue. Do you consider this a nuisance? And they can answer any way they want to. And if they think it is, then that answer, yes. So if, you, if it may be an issue later, that would probably be a good thing. Uh, so you have that. And then on the buyer side, uh, something like this works well. Contact, you know, the city of Anaheim, the city of or whatever or sheriff, police regarding law enforcement issues in this community. Kind of a generic statement. Um, when I made my last move in San Diego from one place in San Diego to another, it was um, about three years ago. And I, I did that. I went to, uh, it's an Encinitas. They have a sheriff there. I went to the sheriff's department. So I'm moving here. Can you give me a readout? They gave me just reams of paper that spewed out of this thing about phone calls they got from residents in that community about, you know, we have some, we think somebody's breaking in or we have a vagrant or we have, so I just, I got a really good feel for the area from that. And then also maybe with the buyers um, uh, in a correspondence with them that you can confirm they received back and in, in the notes, I have a way to make sure that you can prove that they got it and that they read it. I encourage you to drive around the community at different times to see if you're comfortable with the area. And as far as I know, that's all that can be done. The sellers disclose the issue if they are okay with doing that. Uh, the buyers have been directed to law enforcement for local information. You've encouraged them to look around, drive around different times of the day to make sure you're comfortable. And I do not know right now any more to do than that. So anyway, uh, there'll be a lot more on the notes. And um, if you ever have questions for me, uh, you can call me. But if you want to email me that way, when I answer, I can copy Richard in so he knows what I'm saying. There's no cost at all. If you want to send me an in and out burger coupon, fine. But, no, <laughs> kidding. Uh, but anyway, thanks, Richard, for having me. Um, in. By the way, we have two uh, questions possibly in the chat. If you can click on that, you may have answered them already. Oh, all right. No, all right. Manny's got information, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks yeah. for. That's perfect, Manny. Does anybody have any questions, Robert? Yep, Robert. Thank you. Oh, here. Okay. Um, the best. 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 Well, it's usually 1972 for the ceiling stuff, but you know, in the furnaces and the, the, it, it can vary. And, and you really have to know what you're looking for to even know it because it could have been replaced five years ago, but go ahead. Right, so what happens like if, when you, I don't know, if you were a seller or a buyer, either way, Well, if, if it's like, for example, if it's around the heating pipes and it looks like it's falling, as asbestos is but not a. Know, like, you know, like, okay, okay. It, done, but, you know, okay, like a, a general disclaimer. Yes. Well, it probably wouldn't be one because then you have to make a general disclaimer about every single thing that somebody could sue over, and you don't want to isolate one thing only. And you made a disclaimer about that, but you didn't make a disclaimer about the water quality or the pipes in the attic, are they plastic or copper? I mean, it just, but if you actually see something like the insulation around the furnace is falling apart and it's an older property, that can be a bad thing if it's, if it's asbestos. It isn't as bad as most people think it is, but it can be bad. And if it's a really old house and it's got the popcorn or cottage cheese ceiling, which may have been redone five years ago, who knows? But if it's an old house, looks like it's original ceiling, um, there, there's really this. The seller should disclose it if they're aware of it, but a lot of them are not aware of it. Right. And, and it actually is not particularly dangerous if it's in good if the ceiling. If it's intact in good shape, it's really not a concern. Um, I think the point of the question, yeah, the question is that let's just say, if you know, you're going to have to have a question. Is there any way to save yourself later if, let's say, that person? If it's already closed, I would say no. Okay. If it's already closed. Yeah, it once it's closed, it's too late. The buyers do their their own inspections, right? There's yeah. the disclosure, there's a form within zip forms that allows you to list that there's probably 50 different types of inspections. Okay. okay. And you can just check every box and say, I recommend all these inspections. Right. right. Okay. But so, uh, yeah. that might be the best way to prevent any litigation yeah. subject to the of escrow. But the seller, if the seller is aware. But the 
then going back to what it is now, we know going to the adverb expression. Mm. So going back to what you're saying, if we do see something, we can actually do it. Yeah, okay. How would you write that? <laughs> oh, I, I would, I would, I would, I would, yeah, yeah, like if, if it's ducting, if it's deteriorating, deteriorating uh, part, portions of the ceiling appear to be deteriorating, but I, I wouldn't, know. I wouldn't mention as best as so. Yeah, so you don't mention that word. No, just say it's, if it's you're, you're no. it's deteriorating. Or just deterioration. Not, not, not that big of a deal, just deterior, some deterioration. Yeah, okay. And that's a good one. Some deterioration at ceiling in this room. Okay. That way you don't have to point it out where it is. Right. Flaking sounds like you're yeah, minimizing the, whole, the description. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Whereas whole ceiling sounds But sometimes it's always hard to find the right term. Yeah. Like that's, really there. That's well, like, call me. <laughs> all right. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Robert, all right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'll go home now. <laughs> all right. Yeah, and send him some burgers, please. Okay. <laughs> I think that Double as a matter of fact. Oh, did you have a question? Can, can, is I'm going. Uh, Julie asked me to plug her. Oh, thing. please, and please. Then, yeah, Actually, she, Alex. Yeah. Um, she weren't able to come to the office, but she asked me to plug her new listing. Uh, it's at 34 Jindery Irvine. It's a beautiful four bedroom house. Has a loft and a den, so you can convert it, make it five plus one. Um, it's listed at 1.75, so very aggressively priced for a quick sale. If you have a buyer, bring, bring them over. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Anybody else? Now, okay, that concludes today's meeting. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Maria. You look so different today. <laughs> thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.